So I'm going to assume if you're in this room, you want to learn how to generate income from a branded blog. Um, just as a little bit of a caveat, this works just as well for companies that have a commercial blog. Um, to be completely honest with you, it works for any blog. Uh, you do not want to have a blog that is, is crap or it's not going to do you any good, whether you're an affiliate, whether you're a large company uh, or corporation. So this is really just good common sense. And it's also not wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, trying to make as much money as you can. Um, you know, in three months, and if the site dies after that, this is for people looking to build a long-term income with a specific domain or site. Um, so just to save everybody, I talk really fast. I know this. So over the years, I've learned that if you write down that URL um, that's up there on the screen, Anything that I go, I've written more about that, or any tool, anything that I've mentioned in here is all linked up on that page. Um, so that way you guys can and hopefully listen and not have to be scribbling down notes the entire time. Um, so my name is Ray Hoffman. Uh, I go online by Sugar Ray. I have been an affiliate since uh, the early 2000s. Um, I was primarily an affiliate my entire career. Uh, about a little less than two years ago, I started a search engine marketing agency because the majority of the affiliate work that I did um, was via search engine optimization. That is still true today. Um, so for the last 13 years, um, I have been building sites that I build them in a way to be defensible against Google so that I'm not gaming the latest, the latest algorithm update and so that I also don't have to fear the next algorithm update. Um, and that's kind of what I'm going to go over with you guys, but with the end game being to make money because that's why we're all affiliates, because we don't want to answer to a boss and we want to make money. Um, so. With that, this is usually where everybody starts, right? And this is like what everybody feels like when they're trying to find a niche. It's like all the good ones are gone. You don't know how you're going to find one. How are you going to be able to even figure out what you want to start your blog on? Now, how many people in this room already have a niche? And how many people are still looking for a niche? And how many people have a niche, but hey, you'll always take a new niche if you can find one? Okay. <laughs> Um, so finding a niche, this is like one of the biggest ones when people are looking for a way to build out a branded blog. Um, so usually what I tell people is you're going to sit down and you're going to brainstorm this, right? And so you're going to look at your hobbies. What is it that you like to do? I like to puzzle. It's not really a you know, hobby that generates revenue. I might be able to sell puzzles for $7.99 with an Amazon link and get 5%, but I don't want to do the math on how many of those I would have to sell. So sometimes your hobbies aren't good enough. Um, and so a lot of times I tell people to pull their friends on Facebook and ask them what they like to do. But don't tell them that you're asking them because you want to find a money-making industry. Um, because somebody may brew beer, and I, I actually have a friend that brews beer, and she may think, well, they can't make money with that. It's not like they're going to start brewing beer and selling it. Ah, but people who brew beer buy really expensive supplies. Um, so I pull them. I don't tell them why I'm asking them. So looking at their hobbies, um, searching hobbies through Google, if you do searches for things like top 10 most expensive hobbies, um, top 10 outdoors hobby, hobbies, things along those lines, you'll find a bunch of different hobbies that you can find online. Um, searching supplies to find demand. How many people in here know how to use a keyword research tool? I don't care which one you like. Um, okay, so if you don't use a keyword research tool or you never have, um, there's one called SEMrush and there's also one called, oh Lord, help me, Word Stream Tracker? Which one is it? WordStream. Okay, there's also one called WordStream that's free. Um, and so basically, if you type in the word accessories, you will have, and I, I wrote a post on this, it's on the, the page where I, I detail exactly out, but if you do a post or do a search on accessories, people that are looking for accessories are looking for accessories to things that they also buy. So you can find a lot of interesting niches that you didn't know existed by searching for ex just accessories in general and plowing down through the list. Um, and it, it's a really good way to find some niche areas for things that, you know, it's, it's one of those things, you go to search for a niche and like, you know, you type a niche idea, you're going to get the same list that everybody else has um, of the 100 most played to death niches in affiliate marketing. Um, going through accessories kind of gives you a look at what people are looking to accessorize and it's because it's usually a little cottage industry that people are buying a lot of products around. 
Um, so when you're using the keyword research tool, I often search accessories and I search supplies. Those two words bring up a lot of indie niches that you wouldn't necessarily think about otherwise. Um, also research periodicals. You can go to magazines.com and they have like, I don't know, over a thousand magazines. Like there's a wood turning magazine. That's something I never would have thought of myself. Like, hey, I'm going to go out and build a site on wood turning. Um, so by going to sites that carry a large listing of periodicals, you can find a lot of niche industries there as well. Um, also searching the affiliate networks, you guys all know how to do that. You get a uh, share sale or commission junction or whatever their name is now, they'll forever be link share. Um, and try and search through and see the new affiliate programs that are coming through or the high performing affiliate programs. Um, and then market research. So comscore.com carries a lot of this. Um, but there's some that's free and some that's paid. But sometimes, don't get me wrong, sometimes research or market research documents are like you know $4,000. But there's times where you can basically say, I want to see all the research for the sports industry, sporting goods industry, and I want to know exactly where people are spending their money and which industries are on the rise and which industries are declining. Um, and you can find that for $149. And so you can kind of see what's falling out of favor and what's climbing up into favor probably before all of the other people that are out there blogging even figure out that it's a niche to be had. Um, so once you have, once you have something that you think you want to do. Um, I'm a big fan of niche research. Again, I wrote a whole post around this topic. I'm probably going to say that a lot, but this is a lot of information to get into an hour or so. Um, but basically, the first thing I want to know is, is there money in the niche? If there's no money in the niche, I don't want to be in it. Again, I love puzzling. I'm not creating a puzzling blog because I probably could barely make enough money to cover my hosting and my domain, much less my time. Um, so the first thing that I do is do searches for the core keyword terms. And I look, are they running PPC ads? If they're not running PPC ads, providing that it's not a banned keyword, meaning like if you were a wine affiliate, you wouldn't see PPC ads for a lot of things because Google doesn't allow you to advertise on alcohol. Um, so if you don't see a lot of PPC ads, it means one of two things. Either you just happen to stumble on an industry that nobody else on the internet has figured out made money yet, um, or it doesn't make money. And advertisers have figured that out, and that's why they're not spending on the terms. Um, I'm not saying the former can never happen, but it's usually the latter. Um, so if they're not running PPC ads, that's a red flag for me. Um, also, whether or not they have multiple programs. I did this once and learned this the hard way in my life. I, a friend of mine came out with an affiliate program. She's like, oh, it's a really good program. And I was like, awesome, and I built this site, and I got number one rankings. And and for like nine months, things were going great. And then she closed down her affiliate program. And I was like, shit, now I have this site and it's got all this traffic. And this was, I'm old, this was before the days of AdSense. So there was no alternative way to monetize the site. So once the affiliate program was gone, I kind of had this site that sat there for a year and a half with top rankings until AdSense finally did come out. Um, so I tell people all the time, I do not, the way that we used to do it in the old days was, as, as affiliates is we would find an affiliate program and we would build a site around it. What you want to do nowadays is you want to find an audience, reach that audience, get that audience as your reader demographic, and then feed them affiliate pro services, products, programs that that audience would be interested in. So it, it's kind of a shift of you want to make sure that there's multiple programs because if somebody's a... a, a God, there's another word for it. If somebody's a jackass, you want to make sure that you can move your traffic to another merchant. And if there is no other merchant, then you're pretty much locked in. The next thing that I want to see is the traffic. Um, is there keyword volume on the core keywords? Uh, are there upward or stable trends? And I'll show you guys that in a second. And are there good competitor trends? Um, so this is the trend for a site, so this is, I used to own, and anybody in here that knows me knows, I used to own one of the largest BlackBerry sites on the internet. So we basically did all this information, you know, on BlackBerry phones and how to use BlackBerry phones and things along those lines. Um, it was a site aimed at, you know, basically BlackBerry dummies, people that weren't worried about the latest scoop on the OS 7 update, you know, they wanted to figure out how to attach a picture of somebody in their contact information. Um, and taking that angle worked really, really well. And we started this site in 2007 which was fantastic because the trend and the interest in BlackBerry was going up in 2007. Um, if I had wanted to start this BlackBerry site in 2012, that would have been a big mistake because the trend would have already showed me by then that it had peaked 
and it was starting to go down. Um, and you can see the next graph, so the top graph is just BlackBerry. The next graph is iPhone compared to BlackBerry. So if you had started an iPhone site in 2007, 2008, when the traffic graph was still going up, you'd be sitting pretty right now. Um, whereas I said, if you had started the BlackBerry one in 2012, and then the next graph down there is BlackBerry is blue, iPhone is orange, and Android is yellow. Um, so the same type of thing. So you want to make sure that you're doing search terms on the major terms in the industry and make sure that the interest in the product is either stable or that it's going up. If it's coming down, the last thing that you want to do is get in on the back end of a fad or um, a lifestyle that's already starting to go out of fashion. Sorry, I'm going to back up here one second. Um, and the good competitor trends. So that's the other thing. I'll go to quantcast.com, I'll go to alexa.com, and I will take the three to five sites that are ranking tops for you know whatever the terms are that I'm targeting in this niche. And one of the things that I wanna see is, is their traffic going up? Is their traffic coming down? They rank for it, which means they should be getting traffic for it. So is the traffic that they're getting increasing or is it steady or is it declining despite the fact that they have top rankings? Um, if it's declining despite the fact that they have top rankings, that to me would say may not be an industry that I want to enter for the same reasons as when you're looking at Google Trends. Um, so the other thing I'll look at is the competition. And again, I did detail this all out. So if you wrote down the URL at the beginning, you'll be able to see it. You'll You'll find the information there. Um, but who is ranking? And the reason that I ask that is, so how many people in here are, would consider themselves at least novice familiar with SEO? OK, good, good, good. Um, so the first thing that I'll look at is who is ranking. If the people that are ranking are like the largest brands that you see commercials for every single, pay, every single day, and there's no individual sites in there, there's no indie sites in there, everything is, you know, the New York Times and Walmart and Kmart and Target, and it's all these huge brands ranking for it. Um, that to me shows you from the door that the competition in that niche is going to be steep to get any type of search engine rankings. Um, the next thing that I will look at is what is ranking. There is a big difference from an SEO perspective when you're looking at how hard the competition is gonna be to whether a home page of a site is ranking or a sub page. Typically, the home page of a site is the strongest page that they have. So if you do a search for you know, your niche and the top 10 results that come up are all root level domains, meaning it's not an interior page on those domains that are ranking, but they're all root level domains. That says to me that the competition is a little heavier than if it was individual pages and maybe a root domain or two thrown in there. Because typically the root domain is the strongest, domain, strongest page on your site and people tend to target it for their highest competition keywords. Um, and also what, what is the barrier to SEO entry? So the next thing that I'll do is, and I do this through some other tools as well. This is done through opensiteexplorer.org. Um, it's a tool that Moz has out. It's a free tool, and so you can compare sites. And so what I'll do is I'll take the top five sites that are ranking for a term that I'm looking at, and I'll plug them in here. And what this spits back out to me is it shows me the page authority for all the sites. Um, the Moz rank, Moz trust, you know, you can put whatever stock you want into that. Um, the other, the, the big thing that I'm looking at is external followed links and total external links. Total linking root domains, you can have 100 million links, but if they're coming from three separate domains, that I, I would venture to, in most cases, tell you that it's not going to be the same as having 30 links. They're having 30 links from 30 separate domains would be stronger. Um, so I want to look at the total linking root domains. Um, and so what I'm looking for is how achievable is this? If the, the barrier to entry is they all have links from 4,000 individual root domains. Do I think that I'm going to be able to achieve 4,000 individual links? And I'm not saying that you can't build something kick-ass to do it. I'm just saying that this helps you know what it is that you're up against. If you look at this and the total linking root domains for each one is like 120, and there's PPC ads, and what's ranking are mainly subpages, like go, 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 register a domain, and then start building out the content. Um, but this will give you an idea from an organic perspective, and organic is not the end of the world. Um, I run a lot of sites on purely social. But from an organic perspective, this will tell you how hard it's going to be to play in this SERP and actually win. Um, 
And the next thing I want to see is for it to show me the potential. And this actually, as sad as it sounds, um, involves kind of a mathematical formula and spreadsheets. So at that URL is where you will find them. I, I didn't, it literally would have taken me the entire hour to explain that. Um, but basically what I'm looking for in the potential is if I were to be able to rank, and there's, there's tools and a, a process that will show you how to do this, but if I were, to be, if I were able to rank for the keywords that I was targeting, based on the traffic volume that's coming in, and based on how much PPC advertisers are willing to pay per click on those terms, how much money could I make if I ranked my, web, if I ranked my blog for those terms? Um, and it kind of gives you an idea, you know, if that result is you could make $220 a month, then you have to decide if that's worth it to you to do it. You know, you take it with a grain of salt, but it does at least help give you a little bit of insight into how much volume you'd need and what type of rankings you would need and what keywords you would need to be ranking on in order to make significant revenue with your blog. And the last thing is the angle. So there, there's nine million health blogs out there. When we launched our BlackBerry site, there were, there were at least 30 other BlackBerry sites out there. And they were all tripping over themselves to have like the scoop, like I said, the latest update that came out, or they got pictures of, you know, the first pictures of a certain BlackBerry in the wild. And we looked at it and we said, you know, we, we looked at all the sites and we said, who are they missing? What audience are they ignoring? What topic are they not doing very well? Where, where are they not climbing the mountain where we could kind of get a foothold and start climbing up? Um, and in the, the instance with the BlackBerry site, it was nobody was targeting, targeting the idiots and I was one of them. So that was where we actually came up with the idea for the site. Um, but nobody was targeting the people that just wanted to learn how to do simple everyday things with it that you know weren't tech geeks. Um, I used to own one of the largest websites on the internet that carried prepaid cell phone reviews. And when we started that site, the big thing was there were only two competitors at the time, we started it in 2005, there were only two competitors at the time that were allowing consumers to leave reviews of the cell phones, and they both only featured four prepaid providers apiece. They were CNET and About.com. We set out, did at the time, there were only like 18 providers, but gave consumers a way to leave reviews on all those providers, and because we were the only site that had the ability to leave reviews on certain providers, it started the traction. Um, by 2012, that site had over 30,000 user consumer-generated consumer reviews um, that were like all real that you know we weren't having a bot create in our basement. Um, so anytime that you're looking at the niche, you need to be able to tell me what it is that you can do different in it. What is it that you can do better than the competition? What can you add that they're ignoring? Um, you really need to find that angle because without that angle, without, and I, I don't know if you guys ever heard this term, but POD, it stands for point of difference. Without that point of difference, you are not going to be able to build a branded blog and you're not going to be able to generate income with a branded blog. Um, so again, figure out how you can be different. Um, and so the list that I usually go down is what content are they lacking? What features are they lacking? Sometimes it's, it's something simple. Sometimes they have the content, but they haven't packaged it in a pretty little package that makes it look like a calculator versus you know the actual written long in-depth content that they have on their site. Um, what are they doing well that you feel you could do better? Sometimes you don't need to do what they're not doing well. Sometimes you just need to see what they're doing well and do it better. Um, is there a missed demographic your, your potential competitors are failing to specifically target? Um, so you know a lot of cooking blogs have found success with, I was talking to a guy that owned one the other day and he has huge traffic numbers because he targeted single men who wanted to have decent meals. And if you think about it, most cooking blogs that you go to, targeting women. Um, they're targeting women with families that are making you know, portions for four to six. And this guy went and did a recipe blog where everything was broke down so it only made one portion that you could double if you were really hungry, um, or I guess had a date coming over. Um, so that's where he found his niche and where he found his PO, PO point of difference in an industry that is hugely saturated in the recipe blogging market. Um, are there any promotional avenues your competitors are ignoring that you could rock? Um, so are they not active on Facebook? Are they not active on Pinterest? Are they not active on Instagram when your demographic is actually Instagram? We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but is there anything, is there any way that you could promote a website that they're not using? I, I'm telling you, Google Plus is going to start playing a larger part in the SERPs. So if you are in a niche 
that has not had anybody that started blowing up Google Plus yet, I would suggest that maybe you start trying to be the person that's going to do that. And I'm not saying that it won't be lonely, and I'm not saying that you won't be posting a lot to nobody. I'm just saying secure your foothold in it now as more people are starting to adopt it, and as Google's starting to take it into account in the ranks. And I, I know that if you know anything about search engine optimization, then you've heard that Google does not use plus ones when considering rankings, and I'm going to show you why that's a semantic issue. Um, um, and what they say does not necessarily correlate to what actually happens. Um, so, and what voice is your competition using and can you use a different one? Um, when, for instance, in the internet marketing industry, right, there are, I mean, you guys can probably count on like your hands, your toes, and everybody in your rows, hands and toes, how many, you know, SEO, marketing, blogging gurus you have read, um, you know, this week, let alone in the last few months, in the last few years. Um, and for me personally, like even with Sugar Ray, my point of difference, aside from I'm told that I scare people sometimes, but I have always been like really outspoken. I've never been afraid to curse on my blog. I've never been afraid to call it how I see it. I've never been afraid to call somebody as I see them. Um, and I'm not saying that that works for everybody. I'm not saying for everybody. But that was the genuine reflection of me. Um, and that was my voice. And the reason that it works is because it was my voice. Um, if somebody who is really sweet and, you know, I don't know how many people, but there's, there's a girl named Shannon here in the front row. And she is just, she's very sweet and very nice. And if she tried to blog like me, it would come across as like, what is she doing? Um, but when I do it, because the voice is, is, is actually me and it's genuine, um, it comes across as being unique. So if you can find your way to talk to your audience, and that doesn't always happen overnight, your first blog post, and if, if for those of you that have existing blogs, I want you, when you go home tonight, to go look at your very first blog post that you put up and then look at the last blog post that you publish. And you'll notice that your voice has changed dramatically in that time frame, because over time you've learned to kind of understand what your readers want to see and what they want to hear from you. Um, and there's a way that you can kind of sit down and try and plan that out before you have 50 to 60 posts under your belt. Um, so being different is one of the biggest ways to stand out. And again, I'm an SEO and affiliate blogger. I, there are thousands and thousands and thousands of us. Um, the reason that I'm standing on stage is because I used a unique voice to stand out. So keep that in mind when you're blogging, whatever it is that you're blogging for, you know, I know not everybody's blogging for marketing. I don't care. I have, I have one blog that I have that blogs about the country lifestyle. Um, so it's kind of like, it's, it's not unique to marketing. Find your voice. You'll resonate with an audience. Um, and I always say that I would rather have 5,000 readers than 50,000 subscribers any day of the week. So I want people that actually read me. Um, and they're going to do that more likely if I'm genuine. Um, Okay, so how many people have heard this phrase, content is king? It's like a horrible, horrible phrase um, because it's not king. Um, you know, not, well, it's not king because like king is like you're born into it and then somebody dies and suddenly you're king. And it's like you can't just write awesome content and like people are just going to find it um, and link to it. And, you know, if you ask Google what to do in order to be able to rank organically, they'll tell you just create good content and the rankings unicorn will carry you over the rankings rainbow and you will be rewarded with number one rankings. Um, anybody that actually builds blogs, anybody that actually does SEO knows that that is bullshit. And that's why content is king is a BS mon mantra. Um, and I'll give you an example with that same BlackBerry site. We had actually gotten one of those coveted tech scoops. Some guy who liked our blog sent us an email with some pictures of a phone that nobody knew existed, or there had been rumored, but nobody had seen yet. And he embargoed us and said, you, you can't publish it until Monday. Sunday, the largest tech site, the largest BlackBerry tech site in the industry published their own version of it with different pictures. So the two different guys tipped us off. And we immediately thought like, oh my God, we're done. Like they posted it, ours isn't gonna be news now. But they just relied on the fact that they were who they were. So, psh, and Gadget was just going to pick that shit up. Um, they didn't need to actually go out and promote it. And when we realized that none of the major tech sites had picked it up Monday morning, 
we published ours and went out and promoted the hell out of it. Um, and it turned out that one, the guys who wrote this blog kind of had egos, so most of the tech sites were happy to have a different site to link to. Um, but you know, just again, further proof that content is not king, is not always king. Sometimes you just write really good content. Um, but I like to use this as an example all the time because you know Carrie Underwood. That by the way, that's Carrie Underwood for anybody who doesn't know. Um, she was on American Idol and is now like a huge giant country star that is married to some sports guy that makes like millions and millions of dollars, meaning most people hate her. Um, so she has always been able to sing. She's always had an amazing voice. She didn't, she didn't get it all of a sudden at 19 years old when she auditioned for American Idol, but until American Idol put her on a stage and gave her an audience, all she was was somebody singing in her shower. So you can have the best voice in the world. She's had that voice for years. But it wasn't until somebody took that voice and put it on display and said, hey, you need to look at this voice. Hey, you need to look at this voice. Hey, you need to look at this voice that she landed a record contract. Um, and it's the same thing with your content. Now, that said, please do not contact me about every blog post that you write and ask me to promote it for you. Um, you know, most blogs usually follow the 80-20 rule, which is 80% of your content is good and the other 20% is freaking awesome. And I only want to hear from you when you have something freaking awesome. Um, so kind of keep that in mind because if you ask for those types of favors too much or promote to people too much, you're basically become like the boy who cried wolf and you know, your email is kind of like just delete. This guy's always giving me bad tips um, that aren't really tips and are more just trying to promote him. So how many people in here run on WordPress? How many people run on something other than WordPress? Um, I, recently sp I, I recently spoke at a conference where half the room was using Blogger. Um, so this slide was in that, and I was just like, I don't even know what to tell you people now. Um, but so information, information architecture, let me ask you guys a quick question. How many people on your blog is your main page static, meaning it's not just a listing of your posts, it's an actual like individual page? Okay, three. And then I guess the rest of you, your main page is, it starts with a listing of your blog posts. Is there a WordPress theme I'm not aware of that lets you do a third option? What, uh, like WooCommerce? Well, like, I'm thinking like mixing Genesis with WooCommerce, but okay. Um, so typically what I tell people, and I'll try and get through this quick since this only applies to three of you, um, but if, uh, actually no, this applies to the rest of the room. The next one only applies to the three of you. Um, so you've got your main page and you've got your main core pages, right? Your about page, privacy page, contact page, advertise page, and disclaimer page. If you do not have a disclaimer, or uh, sorry, if you do not have a disclaimer page, you need one according to the FTC, um, if, or disclosure page. Uh, disclaimer, disclaimer, disclosure, either way, you need to tell people, hey, I may be paid for the products that you, the links that you click on on my blog. Um, and then the privacy page, if you are using Google Analytics and you do not have a privacy page, you are violating their terms of service. Um, so just as an FYI, if you are using Google Analytics, you need to have a privacy page on your site. Um, and then you have your main category pages. And the reason that I put this in here is because one, too many people use a hybrid of categories and tags. You can use both. From a user perspective, it is, it's awesome to use tags. Um, from a search engine per perspective, if you have 974 tags and all those tag pages contain an average of 1.2 posts a piece, it's not smart to let Google index all those because Google will see them and consider them duplicate content because there's not much variation on them. They look like they have 200 words because they cut off or if they're doing the whole post, it's doing even more damage. Um, so usually from an information architecture standpoint, if you have a blog, the way it should work is your main page, your main page links to all your core pages, and then your main page links to all your most important category pages. And those are the key pages that you allow Google to index, and then if you need subcategories within those categories, you put those subcategories in there. The reason that I tell people to do this is because when Google is crawling your site, it is looking at the anchor text from the page that, it, it, that, that it's leaving to come to your page as sort of an indication about what your site's about. So if where there, if, let's say that you're using date-based archives and that's all that you're using, then all the links that are pointing to your page say January 2011. So that's the theme of your category page now, or you know, your date archive page, which it's the same as a category page, it's just called a date archive page. So now you have this awesome themed, pose, themed page for January of 2011 that links out to all of these other really good articles about you know recipe blogging. Um, you would rather have 
this really strong page with links to it that say, you know, I'm going to pronounce it wrong, so just to whoever's on this diet and gets mad, um, paleo recipes, and then have it linking out to all your recipes because it lets Google flow the con or the theme of your website through the category so it can kind of get an idea like, oh, the main page is about recipes, and then it leads to this page that's about paleo recipes, and then there's a steak recipe page inside the paleo recipes folder, so that must be a steak paleo recipe. Um, so it's just a way of basically not confusing them and kind of leading them by the hand. Um, and I usually tell people to set up your URL structure along these lines. Um, use the custom post option. Um, the way that I always set it up is the page name and then the category is named, the, cat the post is, the category is the category name and the post is inside the category name. You'll notice that there's not that little slash category slash, right? So like you know how when you're on WordPress and it's like yourdomain.com slash category slash category name. Um, you can use WordPress SEO, it's a free plugin, and it'll strip the category URLs out so that you don't have them in there because it doesn't make sense from a crawling hierarchy standpoint. I still am confused as to why WordPress insists on using it. But, um, and then, this is me personally, some people like to put all their post names completely off the root and not include the category. I like that logical flow of the anchor text is going from recipes to paleo recipes to steak paleo recipe. I like the URL structure to be doing the same thing. So, um, and for those of you that have a main page with your blog as a subpage, it's the exact same setup except everything would be inside slash blog. Um, so, and again, this is just so that the search engines can follow it. This is also about building a branded blog because the more that you're found and the more people can actually find your site, the more chance you have to build a brand. Um, so as far as content optimization, the second reason that you need the WordPress SEO plugin is this. So we have what I, I refer to them internally as you have your magazine headlines and you have your shit people is that people are actually searching for headlines. Um, so your magazine headline might be how to turn his head and get noticed. Um, nobody's searching for how to turn his head and get noticed. They're searching for dating tips or, or you know, uh, I'm married. I haven't done this in a while. I'm sorry. I can't come up with dating keywords on the fly. Um, but you know, so they're looking for they're they're looking for keyword based things. So WordPress SEO will allow you to name a post whatever you want. You can be like today and dabbles and oranges, um, and then you can actually assign a title for the post that centers more around a keyword. Um, in order to find keywords to target, you can use Semrush.com. You can use RavenTools.com. You can use Word stream dot com sorry there's two products and they're very sim they're very similarly named and I get confused by them um, the post optimization again we just went over the post titles versus the post title tags um, meta descriptions okay so these don't have much to do with helping you rank from an SEO perspective but if the keyword that the user is searching for is in your meta description tag then when you show when somebody does a search and your site shows up in Google then the text that's underneath of it if it contains that keyword will show the meta description versus grabbing some random section of your site that says copyright 2012. Um, so you can write these, these are not going to help you rank at all, but if you write them as many marketing messages, they will help increase your click-through rate for whatever keywords you're already showing for. If instead of them being random snippets of words from your page, it says something along the lines of, check out this post to find out exactly how to build a branded blog and make more affiliate income you're probably more likely to click on that than branded dot, 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 income, affiliate, copyright 2011. Um, so from that perspective, that's why meta descriptions matter. And then internal linking, if you have a post on a paleo steak recipe and you have another post where you write those words, you should link back to it. Please don't do this in an automated fashion. I know it's easier, um, but it also increases the likelihood that you're going to show Google the fact that you're doing it unnaturally and automatically. Um, only do it once. You don't need to link every instance and they don't always need to be like super, super keyword heavy. You can always say, I have a great or steak paleo recipe here and link up here, but just make sure that if you mention something you already have an article on, that you're cross-linking to something that you've already written. Category optimization. Um, is anybody in here not using Thesis or Genesis? Okay, so for you guys, you just have to edit, or depending on, if you're using another theme that allows you to edit categories very easily, um, I, sorry, I should have said who's here is still using standard WordPress template themes. They're a little bit harder to edit. Um, but basically, your category optimization, rather than having people land on it, and all it is is like, 
play your recipes, and then a listing of your recipes, turn that into a landing page. Um, turn that into get them to sign up for your email list. Turn that into get them to buy an ebook that has your top 14 favorite recipes in it or a month's worth of, of recipes that you can make at night. Um, but turn that into something that actually has content on it and is a value itself versus just leading people to other pages that actually have content on it and have value themselves. And the reasoning for that is, is because the more links that you can get those category pages, the better SEO wise, search engine ranking wise, the posts within those categories will do. And the more chance you, the, the more content you have on your category page and the more customized and tricked out it is, the more likely you are to get links to it. Um, so basically, your post content should contain your keywords. Your keyword should be in your post title. Your post or your keyword should also be in your title tag. You should have a meta description. You should be using internal linking to link to the next, next piece of post content and repeating the cycle. Um, so creating awesome content that people want to find. I have no idea where I am on time, by the way, but creating awesome content that people want to find. Um, so this is like a new phrase in the SEO industry. It's the same thing that anybody who's been building links decently for the last 10 years has been doing, but there's this new phrase called content marketing. It's this totally new concept where you make killer content on your website and then people link to it and visit your website. And I know that we weren't doing that before 2011 or 12, um, but apparently some people think that we weren't. So. Um, this is not necessarily me pushing content marketing. Um, I tell people there are typically two types of content, the content that you wanna write and the content that I wanna find. Those are the only two types of content that there are. Um, so the way that I look at it is you kind of want to find this intersection of what you actually want to blog about and what actually interests you and what you can actually sit down and bring yourself to write 800 words on, what they actually want to find and what actually makes you money. And that, that little section right there in the center is where you really want to be um, and where you will be once you find your voice and start building an audience. You'll be at a spot where you're writing what you want to write. You found the people where it's what they want to find. Um, and if you find the right products, you can make money. Um, so figuring out what content your audience wants to find, that's the hard part, right? Um, back in the day, we just used to go to the Overture keyword tool. Holler if you're old enough to remember that. Um, we used to go back to the Overture keyword tool, and we'd type in satellite television, and it would spit out 75 different variations of it, and we'd write a 400-word article about every single one of them. Um, that was technically unique. Doesn't work nowadays. Um, so Google Suggest um, is one of the ways that I like to find them. If you go to ubersuggest.org, if that's not working, because it's been wonky, the last week or so, if it's not working, just do a search in Google for Google Suggest tool um, and tons of other variations will come up. Um, but basically, I'll run searches for, and if you use an asterisk, it's basically a wild card, right? So I'll put in my main topic and then I'll put searches in like how to, guide, review, how do I, step by step. Those are the answers that people in your niche are looking for when your keywords attached to it. They want to know how do they clean their motorcycle? How do they, oh God, why do I keep picking Oh, cupcakes. All right, I know cupcakes. Um, so basically, you know, how to make cheesecake cupcakes. That if you're a recipe blogger, if you're a baking blogger, that's what your audience wants to know about. And they're telling you because they're asking you, how the hell do I do it? Um, so by going in there and finding how to guide review, how do I step by step, you'll find a lot of content that they are actually asking you or at least typing into Google saying that they want to know about. Um, the other one is Topsy. Topsy is a social scraping tool. They basically have like all the history from Twitter from the beginning of time ever. Um, and so basically what you can go and do on Topsy is you can type in a topic, so Halloween cupcakes. So pretend Halloween's coming up. Um, and I'm a baking blogger, so I want to do something, so I type in Halloween cupcakes. I can sort and view by all time, and I can sort and say, show me the articles about Halloween cupcakes that got the most tweets. Show me the ones that got the most links. Show me the ones that got the most comments. Um, preferably, show me the ones that had some of those things and were written three years ago so that I can kind of duplicate and improve upon what was done, and it wasn't something that was just published last week. Um, so Topsy is a great way to find out what's already worked in your industry and what's already clicked with people, and then you figure out a way to make that shit better. 
Um, reader surveys is a good way. If you have, granted, this means you have to have an audience, but asking your audience what they actually want you to write about. Um, this is from a reader survey that I did on Sugar A, and like, surprise, surprise, people want me to write about SEO and affiliate marketing most. Um, but I was actually surprised by the percentage that entrepreneurship had when I did it. I, I've actually, you know, it, it's something that I only write on every once in a while, but I didn't realize people were actually wanting me to write more posts on that. Um, it's also a great way to find out whether or not your audience is interested in something before you bother doing it. Um, so I'd also ask them, would they listen to a podcast if I published one? And 76% of them said yes. So if I wasn't extremely freaking busy, I would have a podcast right now. Um, but it's a way for you to find out straight from your readers exactly what it is that they want to see. Search Meter, it's a plugin. You install it in WordPress. It tells you what people are typing into your search box. So you'll see what people are looking for on your site. Um, that they're not, and I'll show you whether or not they found results as well. And then SEMrush. And so one of the things that I like to do with SEMrush is, so I'm a cupcake blogger, right? And I'm like a little niche cupcake blogger, and Bakerella is like, you know, the Godzilla of cupcake bloggers. Um, so I go to SEMrush, and I type in her domain name and say, hey, SEMrush, show me all the organic keywords you think are driving traffic to Bakerella. So it spits out a list to me. And on that list is Panda Cupcakes. And it's actually like driving an okay amount of traffic to her. So I click on the link for Panda Cupcakes and I'm like, what's the deal with the Panda Cupcakes? Um, and I'm able to look at that specific page now, the page that's ranking for Panda Cupcakes on her site. Now I'm looking at a list of all the keywords that they believe are driving traffic just to that individual page. Um, then I can go in and there is a whole article that walks you through this step by step on the link that I gave you at the beginning and I'll give you the link at the end for the people that have walked in here in the meantime. Um, but so now, okay, so like this Panda Cupcakes page is getting decent traffic and there's more than one keyword driving volume into it. Um, so now I do a search on Panda Cupcakes because, you know, Panda Cupcakes is a pretty generic term and apparently Big Gorilla like really has the market on it. Um, and so I'll go in there and I'll find how to make Panda Cupcakes or Oreo Panda Cupcakes, perfect. Not a lot of heart, not a lot of search volume, but people are interested in these Panda Cupcakes. There's a few people that are interested in Oreo Cupcakes. Hers weren't Oreo Panda Cupcakes or maybe she just didn't word it that way. So here's an opportunity for me to be able to create a post on something that I know people already want to find and then I can take that post and put it on Pinterest uh, and you know, hopefully people will pin it and it'll start to get some circulation. And then it's surprising, even though social media has no effect on your SEO, it's surprising that once something starts getting shared like wildfire on a social network, your page suddenly starts going up for the keyword Google, it's crazy. Um, so SEMrush allows you to do a lot of that. As an FYI, SEMrush is paid. They do have a free version, but it does not give you anywhere near as much detail as the paid version. If you go to Google and do a search for SEMrush free alternatives, I'm, Sorry. If you go to Google and do a search for SEMrush free alternatives, I'm sure you'll find some free alternatives. I just, for the amount of data that I take home from this tool, I pay for it. So, um, developing a social media strategy. So, this was something I think for old school affiliates and bloggers to kind of get used to because it was like everything was about driving traffic to our site. And now all of a sudden we're supposed to drive this traffic to all these other networks so that they can then in turn visit our site. It's like a really weird cycle, right? Um, but the thing with social marketing is, is that it's not just about getting retweets or even the effects that it can, might, possibly could have, does on SEO. Um, so you get shares and exposure. It can actually drive sales depending on the network. If you're on the wrong network, you're never gonna see any money. But if you're on the right network, I promise you, you will see money. Um, followers, subscribers, using social to drive people to your email list, we'll talk about that in a second, can get you links, can get you signals, can social or signals, what we refer to as what I was just talking about in Pinterest that when it's post is getting shared like wildfire on Pinterest, it automatically, auto, all of a sudden will start to seem to do better on Google. We call those social signals. You know, those of us that are paranoid believe that Google take those into account. I am fully wearing a tinfoil hat up here. Um, so social marketing right now, I call it indirect, right? And so that is that um, it may not be the number one way, and I say it may not be, in some cases it is, but it may not be the number one way to build traffic to your website. You may be more concerned about SEO, but social traffic does have an indirect 
benefit on SEO. Um, and that would be that, again, if I tweet something, if, if, if um, you know, one of the bloggers in here, Eric Nagel, if he writes something, we have different audiences, right? Even though I follow him and he follows me and he writes something and it's applicable to SEO and I retweet it, then people who wouldn't normally be reading Eric saw it as a result of being in my tweet stream. And then some guy does a post on the best, the top 10 affiliate data feed and SEO information, how to articles published in 2013. And they link to Eric's because they saw it through my tweet stream and now he's got a link to that post. So that, that's what I mean by the way of indirect. Um, but one day it might not be. And so when I was telling you guys about Google Plus, so this is where it gets weird. Follow me here for a second. Um, so Matt Cutts, who is the head of, he's the spam czar at Google. Um, Matt told Search Engine Land in August of 2013 that Google Plus ones have no direct impact on rankings. Um, and I would like, if there's nothing else that you take home today, take home that giving a page a plus one, meaning clicking the plus one button on a blog post, is not the same as being logged into a Google account that you heavily use and pad with information about your interests and connections. So yes. If you write a blog post and it gets a ton of plus ones tomorrow, it's not going to do better per se in Google. Um, it's not gonna do better for everybody in the world that's using Google. It will do better for anybody that's in your circles on Google that's logged into Google Plus when they're searching, period. Um, and so this is a search result for, and this has changed since then because they've been working on their, their marketing. Um, but so when you used to do a search back in September when I took the screenshot for Raven Tools, um, if you did a search for SEO, SEO software, they were number 10 for the term. So they were at the bottom of the first page. But when I searched them logged in because I was connected to them and people who work for them that are directly connected to them and I plus one articles on their blog before, when I was logged in, suddenly they were number three for the same search. Um, and I, by the way, I ran this, if you, if you look at my blog, you'll find the post, but I ran this, I had tons of people do this same search and logged in, it changed it for all of them. For some of them, well, Raven was at number three in most of them, but all sorts of sites were popping in and out based on the fact that they were logged into Google and who it was that they were interacting with on Google. So again, not a direct correlation, but here's the thing, if you can become that elephant, at the beginning of, of time with Google Plus um, and become the person that's really active there in your industry and nobody else is, as people who are interested in your topic get more active on Google Plus and make more connections, there's a domino effect that will get you guys more, more search engine traffic at the end of the day. Um, for instance, I eat uh, Primal, or at least when I'm not here, I do. Um, and I eat Primal and there's a guy on Google Plus and I'd never heard of him before I saw him. You know, I did a search one day for Playo on Google Plus, never heard of him, but his posts were really good, so I started following him on Google Plus. He ranks for everything I type in now. Everything with the words Primal in it, his blog comes up. If I'm logged out of Google Plus, it's not even in the top 20. So again, ripple effect in the replay in this the space of Google Plus. Um, and then this in regards to know your social demographic. If you are marketing to 36 year old women and you are running Instagram campaigns, you are wasting your time and your money. Um, my daughter is on Insta. Uh, you know, I'm not on Insta. If you want me, the 36 year old woman that likes to bake, you better live and breathe Pinterest or Yumly or, I mean, I'm not saying you have to stick with just one network, but know the social demographic. I actually, the most, second most recent post on my blog right now is about how to find your reader demographic so that you make sure you're not spending time on the wrong social networks. Because then you'll come in and you'll be like, social doesn't do anything to make money on affiliate marketing when really it's that, you, you know, proverbially you were on Instagram you know, promoting menopause medication. It's just not going to work. Um, so as far as finding the demographics, so again, I wrote a post on this. It's linked from the page that I gave you guys, but um, research. So I'll identify who the competition is. We already discussed how to do that by figuring out who ranks for our terms. Um, I'll research them through Quantcast. I'll research them through Alexa. Um, and then I'll also look at their media kits, which is like, awesome, which is also why I'm paranoid and I never post a media kit online. Um, so. A lot of people, a lot of people are aware of Quantcast now, right? So they hide their demographic information so that you can't see it. But then you go to their website and you click on advertise, and they're like, "Download our media kit." And you download the media kit, and they're like, "We receive 14 million unique visitors per month." 
30, 35% are women. Um, so you can find a lot of good demographic information from the largest you know, sites in your industry that offer media kits. Also, if there's any industry magazines, they typically offer the same type of media kits to advertisers to let them know what demographic is actually reading their magazine. Um, on social, um, I will usually gather up, and this takes work, and I'm sorry, but there's really no other answer. I will gather up um, of those competing sites how many times their site has been shared on Twitter, how many times their site has been shared on Google+, and how many times their site has been shared on Pinterest, because that gives me a good idea of where their content is working and where their content is not working. If I see that you know they have Nine, you know, if I keep going down, you know, as Pinterest has an Ajax, it just keeps reloading until you hit the end. If, if I've been hitting the down button for three minutes and that thing's still reloading, um, then Pinterest is, is obviously somewhere that I'd want to focus for that particular um, site because the demographic is obviously already using the site as evidenced by how much they're pitting our competitors. I'm not saying that that is the end all be all Bible because also keep in mind that your competitors could just be really dumb when it comes to social um, and just haven't figured out whether or not they should be there. But that's one of the easiest ways to figure out what is working for them. Um, email list. How many people are running an email list? Oh, so many people in here that were just like me a few years ago. So I, you know, email lists, like that was something like people were doing when I first entered the industry in like 1998. So, you know, you get all this traffic from SEO and you're like, I'm an SEO god, I don't need no email list. I get all the traffic I want from the search engines on any term I want. Um, and then one day Google comes in and wipes out your site. And suddenly all that traffic from the search engines is gone. And you look back and think, if only for the seven years that I had been ranking and getting 5,000 people a day to come through my door to give me their emails so that I can go back and market to them now and say, screw you, Google. Um, and the guy who actually said this to me, so this is Derek Halpern. I don't know if anybody in here knows who he is, but he is obnoxious, he is egotistical, and he is a pure New Yorker. And I don't mean that about New Yorkers in general, I mean he's the combination of all three. Um, and he is probably one of the most brilliant guys when it comes to email marketing and how to make people do what you want. Um, and I was telling somebody this story earlier, but you know, I know exactly what, what Derek's doing. We're friends. You know, he'll tell me some of the stuff you know that that he's doing with his list and blah. And every once in a while, I'll get an email. And I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. And I'll click on it. And he's like, watch this video. And I'm like, oh, I'll watch the video. And then halfway through, then and then at the end, there was one that at the end of the video, he was like, see, got you. You just watched my entire video. Told you the method worked. And I thought, damn you, Derek. Um, but I mean, like, the guy is that good when it comes to getting into people's psyche and building an email list. Um, he literally looked at us at an affiliate summit east a few years ago and said, you know what? I'm going to blow up this year. I'm going to be huge. And we were all like, okay. Um, and, you know, a year and 100,000 email subscribers later, um, he's done exactly that. So he's a really smart guy. Listen to him on email marketing. But again, I wasn't running an email list. And I was like, why wouldn't I run an email list? I don't need no email list. And Derek was like, well, because if Google shuts off my traffic tomorrow, I can still talk to 200,000 people. He's like, how many people are you going to be able to talk to tomorrow if Google shuts off your traffic? Um, so keep that in mind. Build an email list from day one. If you don't have one now, get one. Um, I use AWeber, but there's constant contact and, and a bunch of other kinds that you can look up. Um, but if you're not building an email list, you need to build an email list. And you need to email your email list, even when it's only three people. And I know this part's going to suck. I've had to do it, too. I still have to do it when I build new sites. But when you only have three people, you still have to email them like there's 3,000 people on the list. Um, because otherwise, what you do is you're like, oh, I'll email them when I have enough subscribers. And then eight months later, that happens, and you send out an email, and these people are like, where the hell did this come from? They don't remember visiting your site eight months ago. So you want to make sure you make contact as soon as possible. Um, so I always tell people we're going to market like it's 2016. So for, for every time that Google has shifted the algorithm, um, I've been fortunate enough to at least be a year in front of it. And so the, the biggest way that I've been able to do that is I look at it and say, if I were them, what would I be trying to figure out? What would I be trying to do to figure out whether or not I'm a real site or whether I'm just some site that was put up to game their algorithm and sell satellite? TV systems. Um, and so that, that's the biggest thing that they are trying to figure out. You know, when, the, when Google started, what they originally did was they found popular sites on the internet and made it so that they would come up for specific keywords. And then somewhere it flipped 
and you became popular on the internet by ranking for certain keywords. And everything that they've been doing for the last year to two years is trying to flip that back and move in the other direction and say, no, no, we want to find those popular sites again and rank them. We don't want you becoming popular because we're ranking you. Um, and so that's where brand comes in. And so if, if you read anything SEO-wise, you'll hear Google favors big brands. Um, and Google absolutely does favor brands. Um, when it comes to penalties being removed, you know, like they never happened, they definitely favor big brands. Um, but in general, Google just favors brands. And you can be a brand. You don't need to be target to put off what, what Google views as brand signals. You just need to actually be a brand um, in your niche. And so uh, is your name, site name one of the top 10 search refers to your site? I know Google doesn't show you that information anymore, so go check Bing Webmaster Tools. Um, but you know that's a big sign as to whether or not your brand. Are people looking actually for you? Is your content that good? that people are looking for you instead of only the topics that you happen to feature on your content. Um, does your site name appear in Google Suggest? That is not always, that's not a do or die one. If your site name doesn't appear in Google Suggest, just depends on, on how much volume there is centered around whatever name that you have. Um, but it is a good ind indicator. This is a better one. Does your site name appear in Google Suggest along with your topic? Um, so, you know, if I'm typing in SEO, SUG, I damn sure better CG, SEO Sugar Ray come down in that Google Suggest. Um, you know, so, so that's another way that you can tell if you're a brand. Is your site name your top anchor text? It should be. There, there's no reason that keywords should be your top anchor text. Your brand name here, your URL, variations of your, your brand name, but there's no reason that you should have any one link concentration that's higher than your brand name. Um, is your site more than 80% dependent on Google traffic? Um, I call that a brand fail. If you're looking in your analytics at the pie graph and like the thought of Google going away means that you're gonna jump off a bridge the day after they do, um, then, then you're not reaching your full marketing potential. You're doing what a lot of us have done. You're being lazy. Google's sending you a lot of traffic. You don't need to go out there and hustle on Twitter. Like, you're getting a ton of traffic from Google. You need to realize that they can take that traffic away at any point in time, and you don't have to do anything wrong for that to occur. You could just accidentally put off signals that you did something wrong. Um, do you have a social following? Again, stay where your users are. And are you willing to be publicly associated with your site? So for anybody in here that's an old school affiliate, we have all had those affiliate sites that like, we would never want anybody to know that we were publicly associated with. Um, one of the things that Google's trying to bring into their algorithm is basically the equivalent of person rank, people rank, whatever you wanna call it. Um, but they're using Google Plus and your profile on Google Plus, which you now have one if you want to use YouTube in any way, shape, or form. Like they're forcing more and more people to get Google Plus accounts. Um, and so they're basically trying to figure out what you know. So I'm Ray Hoffman. I know a lot about SEO and affiliate marketing. If I write a post on a blog tomorrow about phishing, should they give that post any credit? Like, should it get awesome credit just because I'm Ray Hoffman and I have a high profile? Or should they not give it credit because it's not about the thing that I'm typically associated with? These are the things that they, that they are actively working to find out. Like, not me being paranoid, they're actively working to find out. Like, I was sitting next to Matt on a stage and he was like, we're looking to figure out what your topic that you're authoritative on is about. Um, so you need to attach your public face to it and you need to get active in your community and you need to kind of show Google, like, yeah, I actually do like this, this topic. Um, I'm not just writing it to make money off of affiliate sales when people buy Dish Network. Um, so I tell people, you know, this basically is, it requires real marketing to build a branded blog and you can't rely just on any one form of traffic. Um, and so as far as ways to like actually get your blog out there, so first off, let's just for a second, especially in your beginning stages, pretend Google doesn't exist. Like if you're, if you're building a branded blog or you have a branded blog and you're not getting a ton of traffic from Google, I just, I ask you for like three to six months just pretend Google's not out there. Um, because then that means you have to actually find other ways to get people to your site. Um, so you can do interviews, and interviews can go either way. If you're enough, enough of an authority, you can get other people to interview you for their site. Let's say you're not a huge authority. All bloggers have egos. Write that down, bold it. We all have egos. I don't care if you blog about knitting 
or if you blog about cupcakes or if you blog about SEO. If somebody comes to you and says, you are my absolute favorite authority on this topic and oh my god I would love to interview you on my blog and you don't make them go back and forth you put your five questions that you want them to answer already below it um, and you tell them you want to feature them on your blog they're gonna be like oh my god yes of course and they answer your questions and then you publish your interview with them but nobody knows how awesome they were that they were so awesome that they got interviewed. So they'll tweet it out and they'll Facebook it out and they'll put it out to their social networks. I mean, unless they're Seth Godin, don't get me wrong, he doesn't care. Um, but for the average blogger, they're gonna make sure that their network knows that they were important enough for you to come interview them. So it's a great way to get exposure and to get links because a lot of these people have press pages too. So when you include them, if you include them in things like roundups too, like the top 15 entrepreneurs to follow on Twitter, a lot of people will put those on their actual press mentions page that they were on a top list, regardless of whether or not there was any authority or governing body that decided that top list. Um, so actually doing advertising, you all know what that is. Um, Offline efforts may not work in every niche, but it might work in some. Um, press mentions, again, that's what I was just talking about. Please don't tweet that one, by the way. My industry has not beat that to death yet, um, so it still works. So if we could just try and keep that in here, um, that'd be awesome. But again, getting those press mentions um, and basically self-indulging bloggers to the point that they consider you press about them because it makes them look awesome. Also getting traditional press mentions actually do something press worthy. Um, broken link building, this still happens even if Google doesn't exist. So there is a there's other tools that do it on the market, and I apologize, but the one I use is Link Research Tools. I have no idea if they have a trial or whatever, but if not, you can. it's called um, Link Reclamation. So one of the things that you can do is you can go in at Link Research Tools, they call it Missing Links, uh, miss, Missing Link Juice Tool, and it'll basically show you a listing of all the sites, all the pages on your site that are currently dead, 404ing, but have other sites linking to them. So these sites are linking to you, so they're either sending you SEO benefit or they're sending you actual traffic, and the pages are ending up on the people we're ending up on a 404 error page. Um, so just make sure in regards to, am I over? How far? Oh, I'm on time? Oh, I said, am I over? You were like, I was like, oh God. Um, okay, sorry, I saw the doors opening, so I wasn't sure if they were like telling me to hurry the hell up and get off stage. Um, so basically, you can find links internally to your site. You can also do it with Google Webmaster Tools. It just might not be as complete a list, but you can log into your Google Webmaster Tools account, and they'll show you a list under crawl errors of all the pages on your site that are kicking 404s. You can redirect those so that they go to actual pages where people can find the information that they thought they were going to find on the page that was being linked to. Um, that'll help you save links and it'll also help you save users. Um, I like to call these guest appearances. Um, so that's basically where I can go for a podcast or pitch myself to be on a podcast or invite somebody onto my podcast but to get publicity through guest appearances. Um, alternate medium content. Sponsorships, not to get the link, have them no follow it, or a kitten at Google will die and your site will no longer rank. Um, link reclamation, networking, JV opportunities, being helpful, real directory, social authority. Um, oh my God, I'm going backwards, sorry. I'm not used to this thing. Go. So basically, building links aren't easy. If you just focus on building users, you'd be surprised how much easier the links actually come. Um, because building links, AKA promoting your site, is hard work. There's a lot of stuff to do. There's a copy of this presentation on the Affiliate Summit thing. They're waving things at me back there. Um, so the last thing I wanted to get to was this real quick. And so if you have more traffic, don't rely on the sidebar to make money. Um, Track what works with SIDs. Do a search for affiliate network SIDs. My blog will come up. It's like one of the top three. I show you how to track them. I show you why you need to use them. If you are not using SID codes with the affiliate networks, networks you are losing out on money. So make sure that you start using them. Um, split test your ads. There are tons of free plugins that will allow you to do that. Um, master affiliate networks like big links and skim links for if you get denied by an affiliate network before Greg Hoffman has a heart attack in his chair right there. I'm not saying that if you were a cookie stuffer and you got denied by a merchant because you suck that you should go apply through big link or skim links. I'm saying if you're a little tiny site and the merchant you want to work with won't touch you because you only have 300 visitors a month right now. Viglink is a way to still be able to monetize links from that publisher or skim links. Um, know your audience so that you know what to offer them, giving them in-depth reviews that solve problems. 
Users first, sales second. Never, ever, ever sell out the trust of your user base to make an affiliate commission because it is way harder to get somebody to trust you than it is to find something to sell them that's actually worth selling them. Um, and so solving problems, absolutely number one way to make money with affiliate marketing. If I am looking how to build a raised garden bed on a slope, I have a very specific problem. If you tell me how to I'm fix that problem and yeah, say, oh, and you want to make sure you use yeah. this specific bed lining available at Amazon to make sure that you don't have water drainage problems, I'm going to go buy that shit from Amazon because I don't know how to build a garden bed on a slope and that's why I'm coming to you. So you're solving my problem and you're legit giving me something that's going to help me solve my problem that I can buy and thus give you a commission. Um, and this is a quote by Seth Godin that I've always found interesting, which is, don't find customers for your products, find that. products for your customers. And that's what I was talking about at the beginning of the session, where you, it, yeah, I'm, I'm almost like 10 seconds. Okay, so don't find customers for your products, find products for your customers. Basically we'll along the lines of don't rest. target ranking for a specific product or building a blog around a specific product, target a user base and then find stuff to sell them. And that is it. So the presentation links are at sugarray.com slash ASW14N slash for anybody that came in beforehand. I'm on Twitter at Sugar Ray, but I curse a lot and I talk a lot about football except my bucks suck, so I'm done till next season, so y'all are safe for a while. Thanks. I'm sorry.